to be here, and uh, I'm going to keep you on your feet just for a couple of moments, and uh, it's been a little while, but uh, it feels like home straight away when I step in the building and see people that I recognize, and I have a very deep love for this house and for the leadership of this house, always have, and uh, I've always felt like there is just a sense of family here and connection here, and so I'm not speaking this morning as a visitor. I want to speak as family, as someone that is with you and for you and cheering you on and and want you to get all that God has for you. And I don't know, I kind of have a custom, some of you are used to it because you've heard me speak many times, but before I preach the word, I always like to pray because I, I just don't want any of us to miss what God has for us. You know, the Word of God, it works. It's powerful. Some of you so desperately need a change today. Some of you need clarity and you need some wisdom and you need an answer today. And and it's here. It's in the Word of God. And I know the Word works, but I also know that actually all of our lives can get busy and distracted. We can have disappointment. We can have baggage from circumstances. And the Word is like seed and our hearts are soil. And I know the seed's not faulty, but I do know sometimes our soil can be. So it's always good before we open the word, just to make sure that we prepare our hearts, that we say, God, I give you these next few moments, speak to me, challenge me, that we take some walls down, that we put our pride to one side, that we put our defense mechanisms on the back so that God can have the foreground of our lives to shape. So God, we stand in your presence. Even that statement, who are we to be able to stand in the presence of the King of Kings? But God, you don't just surround us with your presence, but God, you give us your word. And it is light to our path, and it is food to our soul, and it is clarity in our confusion, and it is hope in our hopelessness. God, your word brings everything into alignment. And so, God, today I pray that we would make room for your word, that we would declutter the soil of our lives, that we would be bold enough to be vulnerable enough, to change enough, to become more like you. And so, God, in these next few moments, do what only you can do. Break what needs breaking, restore what needs restoring. God, we trust you. And today I pray that I will get out of the way, God, so that you can have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may take your seats. I want to invite you on a journey today that actually I felt the Spirit of God take me on about a year ago now. I think it's always best when a message has been lived before it's preached that actually great messages are ones that someone has actually gone through, that they have actually journeyed through. And because then you and you journey through, you understand more what it is that God is trying to say and do. And for me, this has been one that I am journeying. I am still journeying. And it's actually really helped me, changed me, shifted some things within me. And It began for me after I just got back from a trip and I was kind of a little tired and I was in the worship at my home church on the front row and I just felt this whisper of God. You know, when God tries to get our attention, sometimes he does it by saying something that at first might not make sense to you. And sometimes what God's trying to do is put some bait in the water and get you to take the bait so that you go on a journey with him of unwrapping what it is that he's trying to say. So this phrase landed in my spirit and it made no sense and I kind of knew it was God because it was an out of the box statement. And I just felt the spirit say, Charlotte, I need you to re-enter the room. I thought at first, did I come in the wrong door? Did I sit in the wrong seat? I don't really understand what you're saying, God. And so I went and did due diligence and did some work and went back and began to pray and began to seek God and say, God, what is it that you're asking from me? And I began to feel this challenge from God that there are many rooms in my life. There are many rooms in your life. 
rooms that we spend our time in, rooms that we spend our life in. There's the room of my marriage, the room of my parenting, the room of my devotion to God, the room of my ministry and call to preach the word of God. I began to realize there are a lot of rooms in all of our lives that we are in day after day. And I felt God say, Charlotte, I want you one by one to go on an adventure and on a journey with me. And I want you to re-enter those rooms where you spend a large amount of your time because I want to recommission you. I want to reignite a passion in you. I want to fire some things back up on the inside of you. I want to change some ways that you see the room that you are so familiar with, that you have lost the awe and the wonder of the room that you are in. And so I found myself going on this journey with God that has changed me in the best possible way. And I'm here to invite you to go on the same journey with God for all of us need moments in our life where we re-enter rooms. Some of you, your marriage right now, it is stuck. And the enemy, when we get stuck or we're disappointed or we kind of feel like we don't enjoy the place where we currently are, in those moments, the enemy gets busy building off-ramps for our life. He tells you things like, well, just leave the room. Just walk out of the relationship. Just quit the job. Just don't show up in church. Just don't commit anymore. I mean, you've done your time. You've been in that room long enough. I mean, no one's going to notice even if you're not in the room. And the enemy begins to build off ramps. But oftentimes, the Spirit of God is saying, no, I need you to re-enter this room. It might look different when you re-enter it than it did when you were in it earlier, but there's something I want to do. See, God is a God of consistency, and God is a God of faithfulness, and God is a God that age after age, generation after generation, changeth not. And God needs us to plant our roots. God needs us to stand our ground. God needs us to be the ones that are faithful in our relationships, faithful in our marriages. But that means there are times when you are going to have to re-enter the room. All throughout scripture, there are those that were re-entering rooms that God would come to in a moment when they were ready to quit the room or leave the room. And he would say, no, you're going to go back, but I'm going to first do something in you. See, in order to re-enter rooms, God often has to adjust us. <laughs> I have a friend of mine, she's actually from California, and I was with her not so long ago, and she said, you know, I planned as a day off. You know, you've been working, and I planned a day off. Well, this friend knows me really well, so that was a great thought for me, that she would have planned a day off, because she knows what I love. So in my mind, I'm like, we're probably going to go for latte, then we're going to go shop, then we might go to a spa. This is going to be a good day. So when she pulled up outside a doctor's office, I was a little confused. I was like, we're having a day off, right? She's like, yes. Yeah. She's like, I need you to trust me. She goes, I've just noticed some things about you and your posture. She goes, I think it's all the suitcases you drag around the world and all the plane rides that you sit in for long hours. So she said, I just went ahead and I booked you an appointment with my chiropractor. I'm like, what kind of friend are you? Like, I had never been to a chiropractor before. All I needed to know was the noise that came out of a chiropractor's office. And I was like, no, thank you. No way am I going in a room like that. She said, trust me. She said, I think you need someone to just work on some areas of you that I've noticed you seem to have tension in. So I went in and this very large gentleman came in the room and I was already scared. Now I was double scared. And he said these words to me. He says, it's going to be okay. Just let me adjust you. And when I adjust you, you're going to find some relief come to areas that you did not even know were out of balance. And I'm going to apply some pressure. But when I apply the pressure, it will eventually relieve a pressure that you have been living with for too long. Let me adjust you. And he began to adjust me and there was some cracks and it was a little painful. But I'm telling you, a couple of days later, I began to realize that relief had come to an area that I didn't even know needed relief. And the Holy Spirit is your chiropractor. <laughs> Problem is, we don't allow him to do his job. So a lot of times what happens is we end up needing spiritual surgery. Whereas if we'd have had an adjustment, 
we would have avoided the surgery. We end up having major, major work done, but if we'd allowed the Holy Spirit to adjust us sooner, the major work would have been avoided. So we end up with the separation, and we end up with the anger, and we end up with the area of, of crisis because we ignored the adjustment of our temper, and we ignored the adjustment of our perspective, and we ignored the adjustment of our area where we needed to say, I'm sorry. And so avoiding the Holy Spirit will cost you eventually even more in your future. And so the Holy Spirit is here today to be your chiropractor. And he's simply saying, trust me, I want to adjust you. Because in my adjusting of you, you're going to be able to re-enter the room you think you don't belong in anymore. You're going to be able to re-enter the relation you think I'm done with. You're going to be able to re-enter the circumstance with a new mentality and with a greater understanding. And that's exactly what he did for Moses. Moses who said, I'm done. I've messed up. I can't face where I've come from. So I'm going to go do my life over here on the Holy Spirit. And God shows up and goes, Moses, I just need to adjust you. And now re-enter the room that you've tried to run away from. David over here in his sin, in his mistakes, Holy Spirit, God saying, let me adjust you. For I need to use you to do something far greater than you think that you are capable of. There's some rooms you're going to have to walk back into. But before you walk back in, I am going to readjust you for your posture now has to change. Your confession has to be realigned. What about Joseph who had to re-enter the room with the brothers that had left him for dead? But when Joseph spoke to his brothers, he didn't speak with revenge and he didn't speak with hatred. Why? Because in the prison earlier, he was getting some adjustment done in his life. So when he came out of prison, he spoke like a prime minister, not like a victim of what had been done to him. What about Jacob? Jacob, who stole from his own family, who, who betrayed his own brother, who ran away, Jacob. He's about to re-enter the room and go back to the place where he caused damage, go back to the brother that he had stolen inheritance from. And as Jacob is about to go back, what happens? The Holy Spirit, God comes, and God comes and wrestles with him and literally <laughs> adjusts him. Literally, he walks out of that wrestle with a limp. And, and in that wrestle was an adjustment of his posture to say, Jacob, you're going to re-enter the room where you messed up. But in order to go back, I have to do some things in you so that when you walk back in, you walk different than the way you walked out. <laughs> what about the prodigal? The prodigal that said, I'm done with this room. This room doesn't have what I need. I want my inheritance now. I want the car keys now. I am out of here. I am so much bigger than this place. I have so much more to explore. I have so much more to do. And he walked out with a swagger and with an attitude out of the family room, only to find himself with the pigs. <laughs> and the Bible says he came to his senses. And when he came to his senses, he realized I need to go home. But in realizing I need to go home, he also realized I can't walk back in the room the way I walked out. He didn't walk back in with a swagger. He didn't walk back in with like, I'm back. No, he was adjusted and he repented and his posture changed. And when he walked back in, he bowed his knee and he said, I don't deserve to be back in this room, but I think that you are gracious enough to let me re-enter the room. And the father said, I already have the party planned. I already have the cloak. I already have the ring. Re-enter the room. I don't know what room it is you need to re-enter. I don't know if you are like a Moses or a David. I don't know if your story is like a Joseph or it's the prodigal. But I'm telling you there are rooms right now that you are thinking of walking out. And God has sent me to say, don't you dare. 
Let him adjust you. Let him confront what needs confronting. Let him change you. Let him move you. Let him, let him begin to shift a perspective in you. But whatever you do, don't let the enemy build you an off-ramp from the destiny that he has called and assigned you to. So of all the stories that I could dwell on for the remainder of this message, it might seem an unusual pick that I'm going to choose Peter. Because Peter actually re-entered the room also. And from his life, there are a couple of principles that I want to draw out. That are principles you're going to need in your life too. Every time you need to re-enter the room. And by the way, this is not a one-time thing you'll do. This year will be my 25th wedding anniversary. We've been together 28 years. Do you know how many times I have to re-enter the room called marriage? <laughs> I do love you. I do forgive you. This was a good idea. Hello. <laughs> I'm raising two teenagers. Do you know how many times I have to re-enter the room going, I will be your mother. I will have grace. I will have patience. I will do your laundry. I will pick up after you. Do you know, I've been in the same church all my life. That's 47 years, same church. Do you know how many times I've had to re-enter the room of my church that I have tried to leave many, many times? Do you know how many times I've had to come to that place and surrender all over again and say, God, not my will, but yours be done? Do you know how many messages I've preached? Do you know how many planes I've had to get on for crying out loud? And I just came to this point with God where I was like, you know what, God, I think I've done enough. I think it's someone else's turn. I think I'm just going to put my PJs on, stay home, and just not preach anymore. And just kind of like chill out. And God goes, let me adjust you. I found myself on my knees. I found myself before God, and I found God say, you're just going to re-enter the room. I'm not letting you leave the room, but I am going to help you re-enter the room. And I found myself coming back into a room that was so familiar to me, the word of God, the worshiping of God, the team that I do life with. I found myself coming back into the same room, but everything looked different because the room hadn't changed. But I had changed. You know, there are people in this church that have been in this church a long time. And you've got to allow them to re-enter the room. You know, I was in my church as the pastor's kid. And now I'm the pastor. That's weird. <laughs> people in the church that are like, yeah, I babysat you. Why are you telling me what to do? <laughs> yeah, I saw you when you were a brat in youth ministry. Why are you up there pretending you're an angel? Right? So not only do we have to re-enter the room, but we have to allow one another to re-enter the room. Because we all change, and we all grow, and we all step into new seasons. So we've got to allow each other to come back in the room with the new anointing, with the new calling, with what it is that God has for us. So let's just focus for the last few moments on Peter. Peter! I love him. Crazy, out of the box, Peter. Passionate, Peter. And yet we're going to find right now disappointed Peter, confused Peter. Peter that right now doesn't really know what room he should be in and because he's just lost Jesus. He just watched the agony of the cross. But even more than that, he just denied the one he said he would never deny. And Peter is in the fog. He's in the in-between. He's like, I, I think I've blown it, so I should probably leave the room. I think I've messed up, so I'm not really sure what comes next. And so in John 21, we find Peter going back to his boat. And going back to fish. And you might think that what he was doing was kind of retiring, quitting, going back to what he used to do. 
But I want to suggest to you today that maybe, just maybe, what Peter was doing was he was getting ready to re-enter the room. Because Peter is about to go back and reenact the entire scene, play by play, that we find in Luke 5, when he first realizes, I am not just a fisher, but I am a fisher of men. He's about to go back scene by scene to where he first felt commissioned and called, to where he first felt the fire inside his bones ignite with purpose, where he first encountered Jesus that told him things about himself that no one had ever spoken over him. Peter, in this season of not knowing what comes next, goes back to a familiar place. And where he goes back to, Jesus shows up to help him re-enter the room. So let's look at John 21 and how Peter re-entered the room. Peter says in verse 3, I'm going fishing. So the others said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and guess what? They got in the boat and guess what? They caught nothing. Sounds familiar. This scenario has played out before. There was a time when Peter also caught nothing. Now listen, it wasn't that there were no fish in the ocean or fish in the lake. It wasn't that there were no fishies down there. But you know, all of creation is under divine instruction. And on this particular occasion, it's like heaven was saying, uh, hold it, fish. We are replaying a moment right now. And in this role play, you don't get in the net yet. You get in the net when I tell him to put the net in. So hold it. I have this picture in my mind of all the fish just waiting. <laughs> They're just waiting for the release to go. Because Peter needed to face the emptiness he once felt. Peter needed to identify his net. Didn't have any fish in it and it's going to be okay. Peter needed to relive some moments to remind him of the one that filled his net in the first place, the one that made his life have purpose beyond where he was currently living. And so Peter is fishing and has caught nothing, and Jesus shows up on the shore. <laughs> but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus, because it's not time to know that part of the game yet. And then Jesus says something that's so cool. Friends, caught anything? <laughs> now, I'm not a fisher, but I kind of get the vibe that fishing people, fishermen, they like to brag about what they catch. They like to take pictures of the really big fish and let you know how many fish were in the net. It's kind of the vibe I feel about fishing. It's almost like a look what I caught. So this is kind of cruel that Jesus is asking them when he knows that the fishies ain't going in the net yet. It's like a wind-up, like, friends, caught any fish? <laughs> but see, Jesus, Jesus is not frightened to ask the question because he is your friend. And when someone's your friend, they ask what people that aren't your friend won't ask because they'd be too embarrassed to ask it. And see, Jesus already knows the answer. It's kind of like Jesus showing up on the shore of your life today and going, friends, does your marriage suck? <laughs> Jesus is like, I know it does. I heard you rowing last night. I, I see you sleeping in separate rooms. I, I, I see you faking it when you go to church every Sunday. I know your marriage sucks. I know you're not happy. I know she's not happy. I know the whole family's not happy. See, Jesus is not frightened of the answer. He knows the answer. But he's trying to help you re-enter the room. And in order to re-enter the room, there has to be an adjustment. And the adjustment requires honesty. It's kind of like when I'm out with my husband and we're driving. And we see the same building three times. And I'm like, babe, are we lost? <laughs> like, you know, gently suggesting maybe this is not the idea to circle the same building. 
And then I'll say something that his facial expression will tell me is the, like, like the worst idea I've ever had. When I say, babe, why don't we just pull over, put the window down, and ask for directions. I mean, his face is like, don't be so insulting. I know where I am going. I'm like, clearly you don't. What is that about us? That we'd rather circle the block for years <laughs> than be honest enough to put the window down on our soul and say, you know what? I am stuck. You know what? I am not happy. You know what? Things are not good. And God goes, finally. I already knew there were no fish in there. I already knew that you were having a hard time. But until you are willing to face the fact, I can't fix the fact. So let me help you. We enter the room. Friends, got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You're going to find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The first thing that Peter had to do, we had, he had to re-enter his net you can't catch what it is that God has for you with your net inside the boat. And when we go through times of disappointment or we go through times where we feel hurt or feel offended, what we often do is we begin to pull our net back in. We say, you know what? I'm not going to give. You know what? I'm not going to worship. You know what? I'm not going to serve. You know what? I'm not going to contribute with my wisdom. You know what? I'm not going to encourage because I feel disappointed that my net has been empty for so long. Why should I encourage you in your net? And we begin to pull our net back in, our skill back in, our gift back in, our talent back in. In England, we have a phrase. We say, we take our bat home. In other words, in the game, when you're not happy, you go, it's my bat. I'm taking it home. No one can play. Spiritually, we begin to pull our net and withdraw our help, withdraw our love because we are hurt and we don't know what comes next. And Peter, you got to put your net back in. Yeah, but I tried and he didn't get filled. Yeah, but I'm telling you, this is me. This is the Lord. I'm telling you, put your net back in. Put your giving back in. Put your encouragement back in. Put your love back in. Put your amen back in. Put your net back in. So we've been in this church for a long time. But start taking your net out the water, little by little. And you know what? You've got to re-enter the room. Put your net back in. You've got to sign up and go on growth track. You might say, I know everything I need to know. I've been here 25 years. Go and put your net back in because God has another season for your life. And that next season looks like re-entering the room. After he's put his net back in and found all the fish that now have been released to fill the net. He says that his friend in the boat, and we all need friends like this. His friend in the boat leaned over to him in verse 7 and said, Peter, Peter, dude, it's the Lord. The guy on the shore is Jesus. And I love this next bit. As soon as Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped in the water. You got to re-enter the water. See, Peter was the guy that always jumped in. Peter was the one that when Jesus called him, he's like, I don't know if I'm going to sink or swim, but I'm getting on the water. Peter was the one who was heart led. Peter was the one who was, yes, Jesus, choose me, Jesus, use me, Jesus, let's go, Jesus. And so when he hears, it's the Lord, something inside him begins to fire back up again. And he realizes, I have to get back in the water. Some of you have been in the boat too long. You are dry. You are dry spiritually. Your worship is dry. Your prayer life is dry. Your relational world is dry. It's boring. And there's nothing about the God we serve that's boring. There's 
nothing about this Jesus that we love and worship that is dry. And Peter realizes, I ain't got time for you to roll the boat to Jesus. I ain't got time for you boys to pull up anchor and get the fish in. I am out of here. I am on my way to him. I don't care if I get there wet and looking ugly and all my garments soaked. I just want to get to Jesus right now. You ever been on vacation and you are so looking forward to some rest? And you go out to the pool and it's nice and calm and peaceful. The sun's just the right temperature. You get in that water and you find yourself a corner and you just put your head back and you're just getting ready to just enjoy. And then out of the corner of your eye, you see a family show up. They're called Harrison and Bethany. And they have three boys. Now the corner of your eye, you see one of those three boys, the most mischievous one, begin to back up. Because he is on vacation. And he has seen the water. And he is so excited. And he cannot wait to dive bomb in. And before you know it, he is running towards your serene spot in the pool shouting, Geronimo! <laughs> and in he goes. And out comes the water. And you are soaked. But because you're a Christian, <laughs> you don't say what you want to say. But instead, you roll your eyes and you shake your head and you remove yourself from the pool, looking at them like, get your children under control. <laughs> but you used to be the little boy. You used to be the little boy. You used to be the one that when you saw, I can't believe I've been brought to this place. I can't believe that someone would bless me with this opportunity. I can't believe that this pool is there for me to swim in it. I can't believe that I have this moment at this time. You were the one that was like, Geronimo, this is awesome. When did you become the, get your children under control. When did you become a, Toe dipper for Jesus. <laughs> and the worship used to be, oh, like my friend down here. I'm going to bottle you and take you with me all around the world. Because you know what this is? You ever been to like um, a place where they have these water shows and the seats at the front have those like yellow lines on them and it says splash zone? In other words, you sit here, you're going to get wet. You sit next to him, you're going to get wet. But here's what God's after. Everywhere in God's house is a splash zone. Because people everywhere in God's house are so excited to be there, so passionate to be there, so in love with Jesus that they can't help that what's on them gets on the people around them. That when the most broken come in, they sit on that row and you're like, oh dude, I know right now you feel lonely and I know right now that you feel like no one cares, but you don't realize you just sat on the splash zone and in another five minutes you're going to be feeling all of the presence of God because I ain't going to worship small today. I I ain't going to give small today. I took my church on this whole journey after I've been through it. And I had a door on the stage for eight weeks. And every week, a different name would be on that door. And I'd say, you know what, church? This morning, we're re-entering the room called worship. And we began to turn up scriptures about why do we clap? Why do we lift our hands? Why do we dance? 
Why do we shout hallelujah and began to re-enter the room? Because worship's not about writing great songs or having an album. Worship is about you coming and giving God the only thing you can give him. Your adoration and your praise and your thanksgiving. So when did your worship become? Everything you have belongs to him. Even the breath in your lungs. So when did your giving become? He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I don't care about position. I don't care about title. I just want to be in the room. And if I have to re-enter the room as a doorkeeper, I will. And if I have to re-enter the room as a worship leader, I will. And if I have to re-enter the room as a kids church worker, I will. I just want to be in the room. Get back in the water. Wash yourself in the word. Get back in the worship, not because there's a band playing or you're in a service, just because you worship him in your car and in your home and in your workplace. Get back into prayer. Get back into a place where you come before him and you surrender. Get back in the water. Stop having dry conversations. Start having conversations that are saturated in faith and love and vision and hope. Finally, after he re-entered his net and he re-entered the water, there was one more re-entering to complete the role play. And in my Bible, it even says Jesus reinstates Peter. I have written re-enters Peter. Because Jesus is about to do a master class on what it looks like to help someone that feels they're not allowed in the room re-enter the room. And so Jesus lights a fire and he beckons over Peter and he says, Peter, I want you to come over here. And then he asks Peter a question. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. And then he asks him again, Peter, do you love me? Peter's now, I just answered you. But okay, I'll say it again. Yes, Lord. Third time. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. See, Jesus knew there were three denials. And so Jesus knew for every time you felt you let me down, I need you to re-enter the room and know that I love you completely. I accept you completely. That one wouldn't be enough and two wouldn't be enough. But for every time you felt you left the room, I'm going to help you re-enter the room. But he didn't just say, I love you. It was followed by Jesus adding to that statement. Then Peter, three times he reminded him, feed my sheep. Build my church. In other words, I'm going to re-enter you into your commitment. I'm going to re-enter you into the thing that I told you about all that time ago when this first role play played out, when you were first in your boat and your nets were first empty and when you first didn't know what you were called and I told you you weren't just a fisher but you were a fisher of man. I'm going to take you right back there because you're going to re-enter your calling and you're going to re-enter your commissioning and it will look different in the season ahead and there'll be some adjustments in your posture and in the way that you do it but do not ever forget what I called you and what I sent you to do. Peter, it's time to re-enter the room. And I don't know what room it is. I don't know what room it is today that God would have you re-enter. But our life is filled with them. Maybe it's the room of your marriage, the room of your parenting. Maybe it's the room of your giving. Maybe it's the room of your commitment. Maybe it's the room of your calling, the room of your prayer, the room of your faith. I don't know. Just start somewhere. And for me, over a year ago now, I began this journey with a long list of rooms. And I have been going through them one by one. And my prayer is simply this. God, adjust me. So that when I walk back in this room, I walk back in and see what I didn't see before. 
I walk back in in the right position and the right heart. I walk back in if it needs to be on a bended knee or if it needs to be in surrender. God, I just want to know how to re-enter these rooms. So all across the room, would you stand to your feet with me? And the worship team are going to lead us in a song in a moment. And when you sing that song, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to adjust you in your worship. Some of you are going to worship different in a moment. Some of you are going to find that your hands do go higher than your hips. If there's a room today that you know, there's a room I need to re-enter. And don't overface yourself, just begin with one. But you just know there's an area. Just close your eyes all around the room. You're saying, Charlotte, there's an area I know I need to re-enter. I just want you to stick your hands up in the air. Just letting God know, you know what, God, I need your help in this room right now. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your ministry. And our hands are just literally a signal, just saying to God, you know what, God, I'm not going to let pride keep me stuck. I'm rolling the window down in this area of my life, and I'm giving you full permission to adjust me. God, you see all of these hands raised. Oh, God, I thank you for the honesty, and I thank you for the willingness in your servants today to re-enter rooms that maybe they have got stuck in or maybe become familiar with. Holy Spirit, would you now come and begin to adjust every heart like only you can with your tenderness and with your love and with your kindness. Would you prune off our life what no longer belongs? Would you cut back what needs cutting back? Would you breathe on what not breathing on? Oh God, I pray today that there would be a spark reignite, that a passion would reignite, that marriages would begin to be seen differently, that families would believe for restoration again, that those that feel lonely would realize that they have a family in you, God, today. Wherever the prodigal is, let them re-enter the room. Wherever the broken is, let them re-enter the room. Wherever the confused, like Peter is, let them re-enter the room. Now with our hands raised and in this atmosphere, the Holy Spirit now will do what only He can do. So as you worship, allow Him to adjust you.